This is Calabash community and now we get back to Dr. Michael Alexander and this time he takes us to the battlefield in Nigeria. So they came into the University of Lagos into the medical school and went to the director and said um, give us eight people need them <laughs> for the front lines because you got super doctors they can mm -hmm. handle everything and they actually said this you're told they can handle everything and if we lose them it's not as big a loss as losing those <laughs> specialists <laughs> who are all colonels and lieutenant colonels and so on. And did you hand shoot up? What? Did you hand shoot up? Did you volunteer? <laughs> <laughs> they put us alphabetical order. Wow. <laughs> Alexander is first. <laughs> so there was Adiwui, mm. Adiyemi, Alexander. Wow. And five others after that. At that point, you didn't and have a different last name. <laughs> <laughs> no chance. Mm -hmm. And simply uh, an army truck pulled up and we were loaded on and taken to a training ground for that evening. And the next morning, given uniforms and various things and taken to a little airfield in Lagos, outside Lagos, and flown out right into the war zone. What is it like landing in a war zone? Well, it wasn't bad where I landed in Enugu, which mm -hmm. was the capital there, but then we were put in ambulances and shipped out to the front line. And I went out to a little town called Okigui. It was a 60 mile front line I was responsible for. I was the only doctor with 20,000 men in that unit. It was the first um, battalion. First Brigade, sorry. And um, that was it. One nurse to help me, a male nurse to help me who was a lieutenant. And um, right off the bat, I realized there was a major problem. We went in a couple of days' time getting very few people that could be saved because mm -hmm. when they were brought in from the actual battleground to the headquarters, there was a hospital in Okigui. That's why it was chosen for the doctor to be in. And um, they weren't getting their life. Badly wounded by the time they got to me. So um, I asked what was going on. So I said, let me go out and have a look for myself. And that was the problem. <laughs> they were scared, so the stretcher bearers would not go out onto the battlefield. So I said, okay, they have to obey. If I give an order, it's martial law. So if I tell them, follow me, they have to go. So I'd go out with a unit of eight people, which I called a casualty collecting group. And I'd go onto the battlefield and patch them up there and ship them out just a couple of hundred yards where we had to hang our intravenouses from tree limbs and things like that with bullets flying and whatnot. And then very lucky, most of the people there believed in juju, black mm -hmm. magic. So they didn't want to die after dark. <laughs> so as soon as the sun <laughs> went down, shooting stopped. Oh really? <laughs> and <laughs> went back to the hospital and all night operating on those that we could save. And I was there for 10 weeks. The war ended while I was there. Wow. Uh, it's difficult to, I'm just trying to, try to visualize exactly as you describe <laughs> it, but um, were, you, were you at all scared? Afraid no, for your life no time stopped? for that. No time for that. The people there don't care. And there were seven other people, remember, but they were so far away and had a similar workload. I, I wasn't unique. The other, all eight of us were doing the same sort of thing, you see. So, I mean, um, for example, my introduction to the place. I went in, in my, just the battle uniform I'd been given, and we had to report to the officer's mess. To the, um, he was just a major by rank, but everybody was promoted for the front lines to be able to command their unit. And so he was a lieutenant colonel there. So I went in to see him and he gave me my different duties and all the rest and so on and then he sent me off to me a little house had been assigned to me in the hospital grounds and showed me who my bodyguard was and a driver and so on. That's it. And then I go into this little house and there's a little bunker outside, underground bunker, and um, shelling going on. <laughs> and hearing these shells whizzing over and the, and the phone rings because what happened, all the officers who were in the headquarters the uh, reconnaissance corps rigged us up with ground telephones mm -hmm. running the wires between the houses and so so I was in this little house near the hospital phone rings and I pick it up and the person announces that he's the quartermaster and he'd like to see me right away and there's shelling going on so I, what can I do? <laughs> so I uh, he gave me a little mini moke with a driver <laughs> so I jumped in and went across and when I got to his house he's sitting out in the open with an armchair and another empty armchair beside me said, have a seat. In the war. In the war. <laughs> and I sit there, I said, have a Malta. <laughs> I said, what's going on? And he says, well, I wanted you to come and sit here because if you listen carefully, you'll learn. They're missing us by quite a bit mm -hmm. from the whistling of the shell going over. They're missing us. And the main reason you're coming is because that bunker outside your house hasn't been properly built. And if it's a near hit and you're in it, it could collapse. So don't go into the bunker when you hear shelling. Wow. It's going to hit you, you're gone, and that's all there is to it. They said, don't use it. Were they close calls? Not really. The closest call I had is on the battlefield mm -hmm. itself. My bodyguard, Batman, he also cooked my meals and did various things. 
on the battlefield, when I was out on the battlefield trying to patch up people, he stood erect between the line of fire and myself. And he refused a direct order to get down. Why? At the end of the war, he was just a private. Mm -hmm. I told the commanding officer when I was signing out, this guy should be promoted. At least make him a lance corporal or corporal or something. And the commander coolly looked at me and said, no, no need to. That was his job. And when he was assigned the job, he said if you were even wounded, he'd be shot. Mm -hmm. So he was choosing, right? <laughs> so you were captain then at that point? A captain, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, very high rank there because I had 1,100 men under me. Mm -hmm. We should be a major at least yeah, to be yeah. running a battalion. That was battalion strength. Mm -hmm. But there were no higher ranking people. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. had military training as well? One day of it. The morning <laughs> before we took <laughs> off, <laughs> they just showed us. In fact, I learned how to operate my Kalashnikov rifle from my Batman, my private. Mm -hmm. I gave him my gun. They gave him an old World War II 303 rifle to protect me and gave me a Kalashnikov rifle. I refused to use it, so I gave it to him. So he showed me how to, because it, it looked like a daisy gun, when you think of it. Very poor construction, but lethal. Mm -hmm. The um, magazine held 10, 33 bullets, and if you forgot and kept your finger on the trigger, fire them all in three seconds. So you could put it on single fire. I said, I'm not using that. I'm there to save people's lives. How can I be shooting people? Mm -hmm. So once the war was ended, um, did you think I'm never going to get back to the, to the, the battlefield again? Oh yes, because when the war ended, actually I, the war ended after eight weeks of my being mm -hmm. there. So I only spent another two weeks <laughs> mm -hmm. doing almost like a general practitioner. All the refugees were coming out of the bush and so on. So I went to the commanding office after two weeks and said, no, they need me back in Lagos, where mm -hmm. I was still doing my house officer job, my internship. Mm -hmm. So I went back to um, Lagos, he gave me with his blessing. That's when I asked him to promote my Batman, and he said, no, wow. <laughs> he was just doing his duty. Mm -hmm. But that made me fall in love with surgery. Because the amount of stuff I did there, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, broke all the rules. Wow. Whole idea to keep somebody alive. Mm -hmm. Like I say, you shouldn't put on a tourniquet. Somebody's bleeding badly from a limb. You put on a tourniquet, you tighten it to stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. But you have to release it every hour. Mm -hmm. I mean, who's going to release it? I'm the only one out there, and I'm shipping them back by ambulance to headquarters. Wow. So in the evening, I'd come back, and if the limb survived, then that's it. Otherwise, got amputated. But the person was alive. Mm -hmm. So what did your father think of you being on the battlefront? Well, can you believe? He didn't know until I left. Wow. <laughs> because if I had let him know, he mm. would have been very difficult for him to keep it away from my mom. Mm. And there was well, she, she didn't didn't know either. Oh. After I surprised her, when the war was over, the two weeks after the war has ended, I um, got the reconnaissance corps to give me a ride through what was formerly enemy territory, which was actually very dangerous. Because mm. the Biafrans need not have batteries for radios. Oh. So they didn't know the war was over. Mm. So if you ran into a patrol or so, they would have a little fight. But I went there because my dad at that time had been posted to the southeastern state of Nigeria, which wasn't very far, just a day's mm -hmm. jeep ride from where I was posted in, in what was Biafra, and um, turned up at his home, the Chief Justice's residence mm -hmm. in Calabar, the capital. Mm -hmm. And my mom saw these army trucks pull in, and I climbed out. <laughs> <laughs> so she virtually fainted. <laughs> but no, they didn't find out until uh, everything was fairly safe. I think. This is Calabash Community. When we return, the other side of Dr. Alexander. He was a guitarist in the early days of the True Tones. He even formed a very similar band in Nigeria where he was a TV star. We will have that account shortly. <laughs>